Well, hello, good evening, everybody. Hi there, my name is Kim Ryder, and I'm the Director of Operations here at the Wayne Theater. On behalf of our Board of Directors, our amazing ambassadors, and our staff, we welcome you here to the Wayne Theater. Um, it's gonna be a great night. What a wonderful and interesting lecture this will be. So you're, you're definitely in for a treat, as you well know. Uh, but before we get started, I just wanna tell you a few things that are coming up here at the Wayne. This week, Thursday night, we have Good Shot Judy, an awesome band. They are a swing band with vocalists and brass and all things that make us wanna dance. So come and join us for that. Uh, Friday night, we have Empire Trio. Uh, and they are vocalists. They're going to sing Broadway tunes and or movie themes. So that's going to be a lot of fun. Um, at the end of the month, our big treat for the holidays is Elf, the musical. It's going to be on stage for two weeks, guys. And also, just for a fun little tidbit, it is the 20th anniversary of the film. Ah, so that was quick. <laughs> so, yeah, so we're, we're embracing that as well. We have Pam Tillis later on in December. We've got the Rush Experience, Merry Country Christmas, all kinds of great things coming to the Wayne. Uh, so please uh, help yourself to brochures we have out front. And, of course, always visit our website for more information. But without further ado, I would like to introduce Mr. Joe Kuyper. He's that guy right there. Hey, good evening, everybody. Yeah, I'm Joe Kuyper. I'm director of the Virginia Museum of Natural History. Hey, how many of you have seen that there's like a, a trailer down at the uh, lot there at Arch and Main? Yeah, it's got VMFA all over it, right? So what's the story behind that? VMFA, the Virginia Museum of Fine Arts, they've had this art mobile, which is an incredible program that we as Virginians should all be proud of. They have brought this via tractor trailer, uh, in a mobile exhibit experience all around Virginia. I've seen it in Bristol, I've seen it in Martinsville, it's been up here in Waynesboro, and uh, it's been there to teach students and families and educators about the wonderful stories of art. And as such, they've been to 350 different locations with it. Well, you know, they decided they're going to get a new one. Well, thanks to Senator Emmett Hanger and the General Assembly, we have just absorbed that and moved it over to the lot at Arch and Main. And so uh, you're going to see some trans uh, transformations there. Now, let me digress a little bit here. For those of you who've known me, you might be a little concerned. You might have noticed I'm a little more gray, right? <laughs> But don't worry, it's no problem. It's just spackle, right? You know, we've had to do some improvements. We've been doing a little painting. We've been doing a little spackling. It gets in my beard and makes me look a little older, but it's all right. So what's going to happen is on uh, December 9th and 10th, we are going to participate with the city of Waynesboro in an L.L. Bean pop-up event. In other words, they're going to bring a store right here to Waynesboro at the corner of Arch and Main at the lot there, right where the trailer is. And uh, at that point, we're gonna have it open publicly for exhibits. So it's not gonna be a huge exhibit experience, but it's gonna be a fun exhibit experience. We'll have people in there. We're gonna be putting in some exhibits that are pertinent to the uh, Waynesboro, Stanton, Augusta County general region and so forth. So it's gonna be kind of attractive and so forth. And L.L. Bean will be there. On top of that, on December 8th at noon, right there, we're gonna uh, participate in a ribbon cutting with the uh, Greater Augusta County Chamber of Commerce. So please come out for either of those. The December 9th and 10th event will be all day long. Look on the uh, Chamber's website and the city's website for it. And so this is just one more step forward in our establishment of a uh, branch here in Waynesboro. You've been hearing me talk about this for a long time. So uh, we have uh, checked all the boxes that we can as a state agency. We have met with the governor's staff. We have worked with local legislators and so forth. What we need from you, our call to action, and we did this last month and the month before this with the lecture series here at the Wayne Theater, is uh, contact your legislators, regardless of where you live, whether it's uh, Delegate Runyon or it's Senator Hanger or Delegate Avoli, Right, um, we have Senator Campbell gonna be uh, taking over this area. We have uh, se incoming Senator Head gonna be taking over this area. We have other colleagues uh, over the mountain. We have um, uh, uh, Senator Deeds, 
who have all been very supportive. There's been no opposition to this. We, everyone thinks that us having a uh, 28,000 square foot branch campus that has exhibits on the region in which this city exists that will draw people from the Shenandoah National Park and Blue Ridge Parkway. Uh, no one has any opposition to that. It is a great thing. It's a great two-way story. One, it's an economic development and a cultural development project for this region, but it is also an opportunity for our agency to reach new audiences and teach people about the wonderful natural history, the natural wonders of the world that exist right here within the Shenandoah region as well as the Blue Ridge. So that's what we're doing. And we couldn't do what we do without the, the folks that help us. Um, first of all, I, I, I want to point out, has, have you all heard about the new economic development news here through Waynesboro Economic Development? Uh, has anyone not heard about what the, the new, I, I hear a little buzz there, right? So yeah, you know, uh, economic development and the city of Waynesboro has uh, attracted the attention of Northrop Grumman, a major industry and they're going to be putting in a plant right here on the north side of uh, Waynesboro, right? And that's going to be a 300 uh, job situation that should be finished by 2025. It's a major uh, accomplishment for everyone. And you know what? Us opening a branch at that point, at, our, at this point in history, is going to be very complimentary. In other words, we're going to be providing not only the educational aspects of our uh, operation, but also we will be providing the uh, quality of life for the people who are recruited to work the jobs that are there. So there's so much going on within this region. We're so proud to be a little part of it, and we're looking forward to kind of blossoming here up in the next couple of years. But it's, again, I'm going to come back to you. We've got to reach out to the General Assembly. We've got to reach out to our elected officials and make sure that they know that everyone supports this. Um, and uh, we're, you know, I'm wearing short sleeves for a reason, you know, right? Sometimes I wear long sleeves and I roll them up, but whatever. You get the idea here, right? The staff of the Virginia Museum of Natural History is ready to roll up its sleeves, establish the branch here, serve the people, the educators, the students of this region, be an economic development driver for tourism in the region. And so we want to continue to be part of that. And uh, this trailer that we have here with our pop of pop-up event that will uh, participate on December 9th and 10th. We hope to see you all there. We think that will be just one step closer uh, to bringing this full branch uh, to reality. Now, all that said, I want to thank the South River Watershed Coalition, great partners in doing everything that we do here. I want to thank them for that. Center for Cold Waters Restoration have been with us ever since the very beginning, and as well as the Wayne Theater and all the great lectures we've done here. And I want to thank everyone who is online tonight. We have had such great participation with uh, our social media and web media as far as engaging people remotely. So. That being said, we've got a great lecture tonight. It's going to be a great compliment to the other lectures we've had here on a number of different topics related to natural history. We have Matt Heller from Virginia Energy, right? This is an organization that is all about uh, our natural resources and how we utilize them and conserve them. Uh, we have worked as a, an agency with Virginia Energy uh, on so many occasions uh, back during the time they were called the uh, Virginia Department of Mines, Minerals, and Energy, right? Yeah, it's kind of hard to make that transition, but Virginia Energy is continuing to be a, a huge part of our um, kind of our uh, natural economy and so forth. So uh, Matt has um, uh, been a member of this group for a very long time, and I'm also very proud to say that he has volunteered his time to work with me and to work with museum staff to develop stories of geological interest that will be part of the permanent exhibits of the Virginia Museum of Natural History Waynesboro campus. And so without any further ado, let's go ahead and give a warm welcome to geologist Matt Heller, who will be speaking to us tonight. Matt, it's all yours. All right, thank you for the warm welcome. Uh, again, Matt Heller, uh, Virginia Department of Energy. I really appreciate the opportunity to speak to everyone here tonight. Thank you for coming out on a cold evening. Um, what I wanna do tonight really is connect two things, uh, rocks and people. <laughs> and uh, the way I'm gonna do that is uh, the title here, 
by uh, uh, talking about how geology influences our lives here in the Shenandoah Valley. Um, I like talking about the geology all, all around Virginia, but I'm particularly excited to talk about the Shenandoah Valley's geology for a few reasons. Uh, one is that I learned about geology uh, here in the Shenandoah Valley as a student at James Madison University. Um, a second reason uh, that I want to talk about this area, and I enjoy talking about it, is that I've lived uh, in the Shenandoah Valley for about half of my, my life. Uh, my wife and I have been in the Fishersville area for the last 20 years, so, so not only do we uh, walk around here at, at work, but we live here in this area. Um, and, and in addition, uh, I've been at the Virginia Department of Energy about 20 years, and roughly about 50% of the mapping and other project work. Are you all not hearing me okay? I'm having trouble hearing you. Just me, maybe. Oh, okay. How, are, can you folks hear me okay in the back? Oh, okay. I apologize, sir. Um, we, can, we can hear you okay back. Maybe just stay the microphone closer. Yeah, just go on yeah. Okay. I will, I will try my best to... Uh, to uh, to do that. Okay. All right. Well, very good. Anyway, uh, the, the third thing I was going to mention is that uh, I um, have done a, a fair amount of work right here in the Shenandoah Valley. Uh, about half of the work that I've done over the last 20 years has been uh, focused on understanding the geology of this part of Virginia. You okay? Good. Okay. Um, so first thing I want to do is kind of define the Shenandoah Valley just for the purposes of the talk tonight. Um, and really, we're going to be talking about the watershed. Uh, that is drained by the north and south forks of the Shenandoah River here. And I apologize, it, it doesn't look as clear to me <laughs> on the screen there as it does on my computer. Um, but uh, for tonight, we're going to be focused mainly just on the Virginia portion of the watershed. Um, and you may know, if you live in this area, that there are two major provinces uh, within the, the uh, Shenandoah watershed here in Virginia. To the east in blue is the Blue Ridge Mountains, of course. And to the west in this, uh, I don't know what color you might call that, peach or tan color, is uh, the Valley and Ridge province. Uh, but for tonight, I want to dig into a little bit more detail with the Valley and Ridge, and I'm going to subdivide that into three sub-provinces. Uh, and those, the, I'm sorry, four sub-provinces. Um, so to the west in purple here is what uh, some geologists refer to as the Ridge and Valley province, because there are more ridges than there are valleys. Um, and the eastern edge of that is defined by Little North Mountain and some other ridges in this part of Virginia. Um, and then in green, uh, of course, is the Massanutten Mountain area, those of you who are familiar with that area. And it's also a rugged area, uh, like the Ridge and Valley, and it actually shares a lot of characteristics, these two sub-provinces. Um, in this lighter color, there's a lower relief area, and that is the, the Shenandoah Valley proper. Um, of course, we're situated uh, down here within that part of the uh, valley. <clears throat> And uh, locally, between Massanutten and the Blue Ridge Mountains, that's sometimes referred to as Page Valley. Um, and then this area here may be a little less familiar to many of you, this sort of orange-colored area. Uh, geologists refer to this as the Western Toe. So this is an area where a lot of material has been shed from the Blue Ridge Mountains to the west, and it creates uh, some unique landforms, relatively low relief, but it's a predominantly wooded area, um, and it has some different characteristics, so I decided to break it out here as its own thing. Uh, you may, may know, I'm sure many of you know, that people in the Shenandoah Valley have been uh, connecting with each other for quite a while. Um, archaeologists have uh, identified evidence of indigenous hunters in this area more than 12,000 years ago. Um, Hunter-gatherers uh, lived seasonally in the valley, we believe, between about 11,000 and 3,000 years ago. Um, and then between about 3,000 and 500 years ago, we had more extensive and permanent human settlements here in the valley, including some settlements very close to where we are today. And these indigenous people really are the first owners and residents of the area that we're in today. Um, European settlement began in earnest about 300 years ago. And we've done a lot of settling. We have more than 400,000 people in the area that we call the Shenandoah Valley uh, today in Virginia. So you might have a guess that rocks go a little fur further back than people, and I would say they go way, way, way back <laughs> here. So the oldest rocks in Virginia are about uh, between 1.2 and 1 billion years old, quite a bit older, and those are in the Blue Ridge province, so along the eastern edge of the valley, and the colors, I'm sorry, aren't coming out that well, but sort of these uh, grays and tans are some of the older basement rocks in this part of the Shenandoah Valley. 
Um, these rocks are overlain by uh, both volcanic and sedimentary rock layers uh, in the Blue Ridge and also to the west in the Valley and Ridge province where we are today. And all of these different colors shown on this, whoop, sorry, <laughs> go back up here. All of these different colors shown on the map here um, are different distinct uh, types of rock. Um, and together, the sedimentary and volcanic rocks span more than 200 million years of Earth's history, and it also bridges a, a major time interval uh, boundary between the Proterozoic and the Paleozoic eras. So it's been a place of research and study uh, really for, for more than a century. Um, we have here and there in the valley younger intrusive uh, rocks that were originally magma, and they're illustrated by these little red lines here. Okay? And notice that they predominate in the southern part of the valley, um, which is kind of interesting to me. I'm not exactly sure why that is, but, <laughs> but that's just the way it is. Um, and then here and there, on top of the, uh, uh, all of the bedrock, we have these deposits of loose material, and you can see these various colors here uh, scattered throughout the valley. Um, and there are deposits of gravel and silt and sand and clay, um, and we'll talk a little bit more about why they form, but in terms of their age, they range from uh, a material that's as old as 8 million years. We actually dated uh, uh, some sediments down in this area to material that, that's being deposited right now, you know, in the modern streams as they're, they're flowing along. I would say that most of the material is probably less than 1, one million years old. Um, so um, what I'm going to highlight today, and I guess uh, one of the reasons I, I really would wanted to give this talk related to the Shenandoah Valley is that the natural conditions here are so variable. We have so many different types of rocks, so many different processes have been active here in the valley over a really long time. It creates very distinct and unique uh, areas, you know, that vary from place to place. And I'm sure many of you who live here have experienced that and are familiar with the diversity of our landscape and our ecosystems and our rocks, et cetera. So, um, <clears throat> The, the kind of the message I want to send here today is that the natural conditions in the valley result from processes that are occurring within different earth systems. Uh, this is a diagram that I lifted <laughs> from the internet, but it shows different earth systems in spatial relationship to one another. And I just want to highlight what those systems are. Um, you may not think about the atmosphere when we're giving a geology talk, but remember our climate and weather and rain uh, uh, come from the atmosphere and that and wind, you know, and that that has effects on the rocks below. Um, <clears throat> the biosphere is another Earth system, and that's us, you and me, and every other living organism that calls the valley home. Uh, the pedosphere is the soil that we we dig into, that we grow our food in, that we build our structures on. That's another important system. The lithosphere, of course, that's uh, we're going to be seeing a lot of that tonight in this talk. That's the underlying bedrock. And then the hydrosphere, so that's the water vapor in the atmosphere, it's the water in our streams, rivers, and lakes. Um, it's the water beneath our feet, the groundwater, and we'll, we'll see some examples of how groundwater and geology connect uh, later in the talk. Uh, the, the area where all of these different systems interact, um, and you know, this area where we live, um, is known by this name, the critical zone. And uh, it's because, of course, the things that happen here are really important to us, and it's from our perspective. Um, and I believe the museum is actually considering uh, using the critical zone as a theme in some of their exhibits, so that's kind of exciting, and I wanted to introduce that if you weren't familiar with that term tonight. So we're going to be focusing on uh, some processes and how they relate to the geology here in the valley. So the six processes that I want to talk about are magmatism, Okay, and that's basically the intrusion of molten material into bedrock that would then later cool and turn into a, a brand new rock. Uh, deposition, and deposition is a process that is uh, basically the accumulation of sediment, which is loose rock material, um, and maybe one day that sediment uh, might become a rock. Metamorphism is change that occurs in rocks due to the application of heat and pressure. Um, deformation is a big word, but it, it relates to changes that occur in rocks when we squish them, when we push them together and cause physical stresses to the rocks. And weathering is another really important process um, that involves the, the physical or chemical decay of rock and really the creation of soil, but also the, the continued weathering of soil. Um, and weathering, uh, you know, in this region, a humid climate that we're in, 
um, is primarily, whoops, sorry, primarily related to water uh, interacting with the materials, but also air, uh, roots of plants, et cetera, can cause weathering to be accelerated. And then the last process is erosion. And erosion, the, the difference between weathering and erosion, erosion happens uh, and involves transportation, whereas weathering happens in place. It's, it's an in situ process. So erosion is the physical or chemical removal of rock or soil, transportation of that material somewhere else, and then eventually, in most cases, redeposition. So these are related processes, ero erosion and weathering. Um, and so most of the natural conditions we're going to be talking about in the remainder of the talk don't just result from one of these, okay? They result from multiple processes. This is a dynamic system, a lot of interrelationships going on between, between um, these different processes. Um, I mentioned, uh, you know, the valley being a place that has so much distinct and unique and, and different uh, characteristics, and that's because we have a lot of variations in the processes that I've just identified, and they create these distinct conditions in different parts of the watershed. And I'm going to be showing you some examples of those uh, with photographs as we go forward. Um, but the first thing I want to do is kind of go back to this diagram of the different provinces in the valley and just describe in general how these different provinces relate and are different from one another. So the Ridge and Valley, that purple area to the west, um, it's dominated by rocks that um, are resistant, pre predominantly sandstones, and rocks that are less resistant, predominantly shales. And that sets up these very different landforms, these resistant ridges and these uh, really deep incised valleys. Okay. Um, in the valley, in, or, I'm sorry, in the Ridge and Valley province, in the eastern part of that province, the folding is pretty intense. But as you go further west, the folding gets less intense. And you can see the difference, I think, reflected in the landforms as you go from, from east to west in that area. Uh, the Great Valley, uh, of course, this area, um, is dominated by a group of rocks called carbonate rocks that include limestones and a similar rock called dolomite and shales. And that's one of the reasons there's this big wide valley here. We have less resistant rocks uh, in the central part of the watershed. Um, we do have thin resistant units uh, that are comprised of rocks like chert, which is a silica-rich rock that's very resistant to weathering, and sandstone that is also resistant to weathering. And they, that creates ridges and hills, and you can see some of those. It's a little blurry on here, but some of these distinct ridges and hills, we'll see, see those in more detail uh, a little bit later. Um, they create the, the, the landscape that we see within this part of the valley. Um, and I also uh, need to mention these igneous dikes. They're also more resistant to weathering than the surrounding sedimentary rocks, and so they create uh, positive landforms as well. Uh, the Massanutten Mountain province contains rocks that are similar in age and characteristics to the Ridge and Valley province. Um, but the sandstones, particularly the one that makes up the big ridges here in Massanutten, is much thicker. The Massanutten sandstone is about 500 feet thick, where the, the sandstone that makes up this ridge, the Tuscarora, is uh, probably about 50 feet thick, so much thicker, and that's why the, the ridges here are much thicker. It's reflecting the, the geology. Um, the other thing about this uh, part of the valley is that these rocks are intensely folded uh, in here, and so that's another reason it has a bit of a different uh, topography developed on it. The Blue Ridge uh, over here, again in the east, contains rocks that overall are more resistant to weathering than rocks uh, in the Valley and Ridge province. That's one of the reasons we have a big mountain range here. <clears throat> uh, in addition, uh, you don't see the, the sort of layering, right, and the folding patterns that we have in here over in this area. And, that, and these rocks, at least the, uh, the, what we call the cover rocks, the ones on top, are folded, but the folding is a bigger, broader fold, uh, at least uh, uh, in the big picture here. And, and the, what we call the basement rocks, the older rocks down here, aren't necessarily folded, so they don't express that, that pattern that you see out in the valley and ridge. <clears throat> the western toe here, um, it, it's situated at the boundary between the Blue Ridge and the Valley and Ridge rocks of the Great Valley, and so, so that sort of difference in weathering creates this, this gradient here, right? And that uh, encourages material to be shed 
from the high places into the low places. And the deposits that occur down here we call fan deposits, um, and they're, they're coarse, loose deposits of sediment, um, and it really just creates a distinct uh, area, and it's related to the fact that the bedrock in most of this area is not actually at the surface, it's underneath of loose material uh, that's been shed from the mountains. Okay, so now I'm, I'm just going to go through some photographs that illustrate some of the different processes we've been talking about, some of the different rocks that we find here in the valley. Um, uh, this is uh, one of the older basement rocks. This is the old rag granite. Uh, how many people have heard of the old rag granite? or the old rag mountain at least, hopefully some of you have. Yeah, that's a mountain, but the, the, the granite actually extends over a much wider area than the, than the mountain itself. Um, but it's about a billion years old, just a little bit over a billion years old. Um, and it, it looks, ah, looks just like a granite. Um, the neat thing about the old rag and a lot of the basement rocks is that the quartz in this rock has a bluish color. And we only see that in the older rocks in the basement. Um, we don't see those uh, blue quartz grains uh, in younger igneous rocks in Virginia. Uh, this rock is a volcanic rock, so both of these are related to magmatism. One deeper in the Earth's crust, cooled slowly. One closer to the Earth's surface, cooled much more quickly. Uh, this is a basalt, but it has been changed. It's been metamorphosed. Um, but you may notice, if you look closely, a lot of little round spots. Okay. Um, when you have a volcanic eruption and lava is flowing on the ground, there's a lot of gas that's, that's flowing along with the lava, and that gas is trying to escape up through the molten material as it's cooling. Well, um, not all of that gas escapes um, it initially, and so it gets trapped as the rocks cool, and then it, it leaves behind these little voids, vesicles. And then later, other minerals come and fill those voids in. We call these amygdules. Uh, this greener material is a, a mineral called epidote but we find quartz and jasper and other materials uh, in these little bugs uh, in the basalt. Uh, this is a younger igneous rock. Uh, this is a, a, a dike, so a, a planar feature that cuts across the older bedrock, um, and it's a basalt as well. Um, but when we, when we map the, the dikes, we tend to use this other term here called diabase. So this is in the valley, this is like finding a needle in a haystack. This, you know, this bedrock comprises probably just a fraction of a percentage of the total bedrock out there, but it's very distinct and different than the rocks around it. Uh, this is a, another basalt. This is actually the youngest igneous rock uh, that I'm aware of in eastern North America. It's about 50 million years old. It, it forms in the vicinity of Mole Hill near Harrisonburg, Virginia. Um, and you might see some similar textures to the Catoctin basalt that I just showed you a minute ago. But, but this is a really neat feature. Uh, Mole Hill is a positive feature in the landscape, and it exists there because the, the, the basalt is more resistant to weathering than the carbonate rocks that are around it. Uh, now I'm going to show you some of the sedimentary rocks that form as a result of the process of deposition. Uh, this is a, a, a thin layer of sediment in the Blue Ridge province that became a sedimentary rock. It is what we call a conglomerate because it's got pebbles in it, okay? Uh, but mostly it's composed of sand-sized material. Um, it actually has blue quartz in it, and that's because this um, rock formed as a result of the erosion of the older basement rock, like the Blue Ridge, I'm sorry, like the old rack granite, and then the deposition of that material uh, in a low spot, likely on this landscape that existed at that time. Um, so that's, that's a good example of a sedimentary rock there. Um, this is another sedimentary rock in the Blue Ridge province. This is the, old, the youngest, I'm sorry, the youngest sedimentary rock in the Blue Ridge province. This is called the Antietam Quartzite. Um, it's a really uh, uh, distinctive rock on the landscape. It, it's composed of about 98% quartz sand. And so undoubtedly the environment that this rock was deposited in was a beach environment. And I always, uh, when I talk to school groups and kids, I like to point out the fact that the beach is up here in the mountains and just that's kind of a neat, you know, thing for them to think about, right? Like, how did the beach get, get up in the mountains? So kind of a, a neat idea. But this rock's about 540 million years old, so it, it's really just about right at the Cambrian, uh, pre-Cambrian boundary, so this, this major break in geologic time. And there are uh, fossils in this rock called scolithus, they're these little worm tubes. 
um, that existed, the worms existed in the beach that existed at that time. And when you start seeing them in, in rocks around, you, you can't unsee them. There, there are literally must be trillions and trillions of these little worm tubes all over the place. Um, it's amazing. So anyway, uh, that's, that's a good example of a Blue Ridge sedimentary rock. Uh, this is a slightly younger sedimentary rock. It's still Cambrian in age, but it's, it's called the Waynesboro Formation, and it consists roughly 50% of it is limestone or uh, this similar rock called dolomite, but the rest is shale or thin beds of sandstone. It often has a reddish color to it. Um, you may be able to pick that up in this photograph. But this is actually the bedrock. If we were to go outside right now and start digging holes <laughs> and got down to the bedrock, we would be in the Waynesboro Formation. And you might say, hey, that's pretty cool. Waynesboro, Virginia has a formation named after it, right? But unfortunately, this is actually named in, uh, for a town in Pennsylvania, <laughs> Waynesboro, Pennsylvania. What are the odds, right? That two towns, same name, same rock is underneath of both towns. Pretty cool. That, that's not the only example of that, so it's, kind of, it's, it's really kind of funny. Um, this is uh, uh, the next layer up from the Waynesboro. This is the Elbrook Formation. It's a magnesium limestone. Um, the neat thing about this one is it it's commonly has a fossil in it. These are what are called stromatolites. So these are layers of algae that alternated with sediment. This would have been in the tidal zone where the water was coming in and out. And the algae were essentially building up through the, the sand as it was being deposited. Or not the sand, but the, 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 the carbonate mud. And then over time that lithified and became a rock. Uh, this is a younger rock. This is uh, from the Ordovician period. This is called the Lincolnshire uh, limestone. And it, it's distinctive because it has these little chert nodules in it. And that makes it more resistant to weathering. So when we find the Lincolnshire, typically we find it up on hills and ridges because it's just a little more resistant to the weathering. And it doesn't take much, just you know, 50 feet of a uh, little bit of chert here and there. Uh, creates a difference in, in the weathering and uh, the landscape. Uh, this is a, a different kind of sedimentary rock. This is a sandstone. This is the Massanutten sandstone. Uh, it's pretty clean sandstone as well, but it didn't form at a beach. This probably formed in a river type setting. Um, and one of the, the neat textures you can see here, if you, you see how the partings here kind of have a curved appearance to them here and there. So these are old river channels, and so you know the, the water was moving back and forth and just cutting back through its own channel uh, over time as, as it migrated back and forth. Uh, this is a similar uh, deposit. It's also a pretty quartz-rich sandstone called the Ridgely sandstone, but the difference is this one is Silurian in age, and this one is Devonian, so it's a bit younger. The other difference here is uh, you see these little pock marks these are molds where brachiopod fossils formerly were, and the brachiopods uh, weathered out preferentially because they're made of more uh, soluble material. And so the sand is left behind, but the, the fossils have, have vanished over time. Uh, this is uh, another type of sedimentary rock, uh, kind of a mix, really, of one we have talked about, uh, sandstone. These are sandstone layers. Uh, but then shale. This is the first shale I think I've showed you tonight. So this is interbedded shales and sandstones. This is a marine deposit, so this would have been in deeper water offshore, probably in a deltaic environment, relatively deep basin, uh, a lot of energy uh, uh, washing material out to sea periodically. Uh, this is also Ordovician in age. This is the type of bedrock that's uh, in the Fishersville area between Fishersville and Stanton on 250. Most of the rocks you'll see there are, are shale and sandstone of the Martinsburg Formation. Uh, this is a, a younger shale. This is Devonian in age also. This is called the Millboro Shale. Um, it's a black shale, makes a really poor soil. I'll show you a picture of that in a minute. And it's uh, most commonly found west of Little North Mountain, out in the Ridge and Valley part of the province. Uh, all right, so the last uh, pictures I want to show you are of not rocks, but uh, loose material that's deposited on top of rock. This is a colleague of mine, Scott Eaton from JMU. Um, and th this is a nice photo because it shows the boundary between bedrock, so between the lithosphere earth system, right, and, uh, and this loose material which it would be the pedosphere, okay? And so this is a transported soil, um, but you can see these loose boulders here with finer grain sediment in between them. This is a high energy deposit of material flushed out of a steep sloped mountainous area uh, here. 
So just to give you some examples of the kind of deposits, this would be a talus or scree slope here. This is down near big levels, but uh, there's a really great uh, talus slope uh, at Sharando Lake. If you're interested in that, you can get to very, uh, pretty easily from the, uh, the dam side of the lake. Uh, this is a debris flow deposit. Um, I don't know if anybody was here when Ann Witt gave a presentation about a year ago. Oh, good, at least one person. She talked a lot about landslides and the most common type of landslide well, maybe not the most common, but the most concerning type of landslide here in this part of Virginia are debris flows. And these are rapid movements of rock and soil and trees and water uh, during heavy rain events. Um, and this is my walking stick here, so this gives you a sense of the size of this boulder. But these boulders are more than a mile from the nearest outcrop of this formation, so, so that's a lot of energy, right, to flush material out uh, that, that distance. But that's a common type of... Uh, loose deposit that we have here in the Shenandoah Valley. Uh, this is a, 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 what we call an alluvial deposit, but I'll just call it a stream deposit here. So this is mostly silt and clay and a little bit of sand um, deposited. There's a small stream just out of view here. Um, it's the floodplain, right? So we have many deposits like this along our streams and rivers in this part of the valley. Uh, this is an older floodplain, but actually this is the channel, the old channel, because you can see all these cobbles and things. Uh, in here. This is a, a, what we call a terrace deposit. Um, so often uh, in elevated slope positions above rivers and near rivers we find these these gravels and they're, they're places where the river used to be, you know, back at some point in the distant past. And over time weathering and erosion have removed the, uh, the floodplain deposits from the top. So often we just see the channel deposits right at the, the ground surface in these older uh, terraces. Uh, metamorphism, just a couple of examples here. So this is the Catoctin Formation. Again, this is a, originally would have been a basalt. It would have had the minerals pyroxene and feldspar is the predominant minerals. But now it has a, a, a mineral called amphibole, a particular type called actinolite that's a green color to it. Um, it also has chlorite, which is a mica that has a greenish color. And then it's a little hard to see, but this part of the rock has a mineral called epidote that's also green. Um, so that's why the greenstone, uh, you may have heard of the talking greenstone, that's why it's the greenstone, because of metamorphism, it's changed the color. The original rock would have been closer to a, to a dark gray or a black color. Um, metamorphism can also impart a texture to rocks. You can maybe see these interlayered uh, darker and lighter intervals here. The lighter intervals are mostly quartz and feldspar, and the darker intervals are mostly uh, micas and uh, some other uh, iron-rich minerals. And so... Um, often when rocks are metamorphosed, there's what we call segregation that occurs, and the minerals will segregate into different banded colors uh, here. So this, is, this layering is called a foliation. And I think it got that name because it reminded people of leaves, like laying down in the, in the forest. So. Uh, a few pictures of deformation here uh, related to... Uh, you know, the squishing of the rocks, the pushing together of the rocks, mostly through plate tectonic activity. Uh, this is the Martinsburg formation. I've showed you a picture of the Martinsburg already, uh, but here we're seeing two different fabrics. Okay, this, the beds of the sediment are in here like this. Okay, so that, that's the way the bed's kind of in the same direction as the hammer. But if you look very close, you see this really strong kind of vertical fabric, right? a grain to the rocks, that's called a cleavage. And a cleavage is a, a plane that develops when the rocks are pushed together. It develops perpendicular to the direction they're being pushed. And this becomes important uh, when we start talking about water moving through rocks because water uh, moving through rocks provides us with our drinking water, right, uh, for a lot of us. So, so knowing something about those cracks and crevices that the water can move through is, is kind of important for that. Uh, this is a, a, a mud, whoop, ah, did it again. This is a, a, a limestone. We actually call it a lime mudstone because it's kind of a mix of lime and mud, but it's, it's a formation called the Edinburgh Formation. It's the same stone that uh, JMU uses for campus, the blue stone at JMU. But the reason I'm showing it here, if you see these little cracks in the rock that look like they've been filled in with caulk, so that caulk is calcite, a mineral that comes in. So this rock, during deformation, uh, experienced the stress of tension, and it pulled the rock apart here and there. You can actually see what they call tension gashes right here. But that's the evidence of deformation, too, if you see that sort of thing in a, in a rock. Uh, this is another uh, 
piece of evidence we look for when we're looking for did rocks uh, move, is there a fault nearby, these are called slicken lines, there are these sort of striations on the rock. Can we often see them where two rocks have slid past one another and it helps us because it tells us kind of the direction that they slid, right? So that's good. Uh, this is a, a rock called a breccia and so it's just broken up bits of rocks that have been re-cemented uh, together and so this would have been a, along a fault you know, where the rock layer got broken and then later fluids came in and deposited, deposited um, other materials that cemented the rock back together. Uh, we have lots of folds in the Shenandoah Valley and that's expressed in the topography. This is a fold, an upfold that we call an anticline here. Uh, this is in a shale uh, unit um, and the center of the fold is kind of right through here. And again, you see that really strong layering. That's the cleavage. So when rocks get squished, they get folded. Uh, often, especially the, the, the finer grain rocks, develop this really strong cleavage uh, to them. Uh, here's a sort of a map pattern fold. This is uh, looking uh, at the ski resort at Massanutten here from the northwest. Uh, this is the Massanutten sandstone coming along here. There's a little gap right here, which we'll talk about again in a minute. Um, but, but you can literally see the rocks being folded around, and that's one of the reasons there's a ski resort there. You've got this nice north-facing slope, you know, that uh, keeps it a little bit cooler in the wintertime. Uh, this is a fault. We also have many, many faults in this part of Virginia. Uh, this is in a quarry near Broadway, Virginia. Um, and the, the orange line represents the fault. This is what we call the hanging wall. It's on top of the fault on the foot wall. If you look really close, you might see a little bit of bedding right down here. So this, this, uh, all this white in here is calcite fracturing. So that when you see something like that, you know, wow, that rock's really been messed up. And it's been messed up because all of these rocks have been pushed way up over the top of them. Uh, this is another fault. It's a little more subtle here, this boundary that I'm pointing to. Uh, this is a Cambrian age rock that's sitting on top of an Ordovician age rock. And the problem with that is that's upside down. You know, things should get younger when you go up. And so that tells us that there's a pretty big fault here. This is actually a fault called the North Mountain Fault, which is the bounding fault uh, for the Great Valley province on the west. So it's a pretty significant structure in this part of Virginia. Um, uh, some examples of weathering and erosion. Uh, here's the same Massanutten area. Uh, this is the Massanutten sandstone outcropping. Again, it's a quartz-rich sandstone, pretty resistant to the process of weathering and erosion. So over time, it tends to form these resistant ridges uh, on the landscape. And, and, you know, it's really nice to be able to see those uh, uh, when you're standing and looking at them. Um, this is another pretty resistant rock. This is a rock called chert. It's rich in silica. Um, doesn't react with water that well, and, it, and it's, uh, it's pretty strong. So it sticks around for a while. Many of the, the sort of roundish hills that we have out in this part of Virginia are what we call chert hills. Um, this is actually Betsy Bell in Stanton. So if you, when you're driving towards Stanton on 250, that big hill <laughs> right in front of you there, you drive up to the top of that at the park, there's, there's a bunch of chert uh, sitting up there. So. Uh, just a couple of examples of shale valleys. So this is a place called Fort Valley in the northern part of Massanutten. And the unit that's in the middle here is sand, I'm sorry, shale. Um, and that's why this is a low, uh, low area in the middle. The, the unit that's sandstone is the more resistant unit. So it creates that nice valley in that area. And then just a second example of that. Uh, this is, <clears throat> uh, I was mentioning the Martinsburg between Waynesboro and Stanton. This is the Martinsburg in here. This is Christian's Creek that uh, runs up through the middle of this fold. This is a big, uh, an upfold that we call a syncline within this area. <clears throat> uh, I guess I should point out here too, just because it's so cool. This is the North Fork of the Shenandoah River. This is the South Fork of the Shenandoah River. This is the Seven Bends area here. And uh, notice how the river pays attention to the geology too, right? It meanders within the shale. It does not venture too much into the limestones because it's a little bit harder to erode those rocks. So it kind of stays in its lane, as it were, uh, as it's moving along. <clears throat> uh, this is uh, just an a example to show you how uh, the, the deformation can affect the weathering and, and erosion and the formation of the landscape. Uh, this is looking uh, south 
east towards the Blue Ridge Mountains here in the distance, and this is a little gap, so it's a place where the mountain kind of comes down. This is called Harshberger Gap here, and this is, also, this is actually near the ski resort area as well. Um, but this gap is here, we think, because there's a fault. There's a planar break in the rocks, and you can see that pretty clearly here. There's a ridge, a resistant ridge of sandstone that comes down, and then it just stops, right? And then if you walk this way a little bit, hey, there it is again, and it's coming down here. So that's a place where the Earth's crust has been broken, things have been moved, and that created a weakness. It would be just like breaking your arm or your leg, and the next time you get injured, maybe that's a place that might be a little more susceptible uh, to injury. Uh, okay, these next uh, few slides are kind of illustrating how uh, variable our soil development is in this part of Virginia. Again, if you were to go out to the Piedmont, or the coastal plain and you know randomly go to 100 different places you would probably find a lot of consistency but in this part of Virginia I don't think that that's true because you can go from something like this where you have uh, the Millboro shale with no soil at all <laughs> almost zero soil development uh, to something like this uh, in Waynesboro where you have this really thick accumulation of clay and silt uh, a really well developed soil profile um, you can also find places where there are a lot of rock outcroppings and relatively thin soil. This is a relatively pure limestone called the New Market Limestone. And so it, there's just not a lot of uh, residue after the rock weathers that's left behind. Most of the rock is limestone, so it just goes away with the water. So you don't develop much of a soil on this kind of limestone. Um, and then this is, uh, again, another transported soil. This is one of these fan deposits. Um, you can see lots of cobbles and things in here. Okay. Um, very different, right, than the residual soil, the soil, that red clay soil that I showed you earlier. So that's just four random places, but I could show you even more variability than that. Okay, so um, th th this next part of the talk is, is really talking about how natural conditions affect us uh, in terms of building and developing areas and also in terms of making us choose to do certain things in different areas. So the natural conditions here in the very in the valley that I've, I've been talking about make some areas more suitable for particular land uses. Uh, for example, um, if you're driving around the valley and you're looking at where farmers are planting row crops, um, very often uh, you see those crops on uh, loose materials, on floodplain and terrace deposits of sand and silt. Um, and I picked this sample, this is a, uh, this, a photo up near Newmarket, and you can just see very clearly how the land use uh, this is a boundary between a terrace and no deposit and between a terrace and the, the modern alluvium. And you can see how the land use change almost corresponds exactly with that boundary. You know? And here's a great place. Here's a, a row crop field and here's a pasture. And it's literally, you know, the farmer figured all that out right long before I showed up and said, hey, that would be a much better pasture than, than a, a place to plant crops. Um, uh, often where we see cattle grazing when we're driving around the valley, almost, I wouldn't say always, but often, most often, that's on residual hills and slopes uh, developed on limestones and shales in the Great Valley Province. Um, not that you won't see a cow on a terrace or a floodplain, you certainly do, it's just eight times out of ten, they're probably going to be a residual slope. That's also where uh, much of the hay is made uh, in the Shenandoah Valley. Um, many of the towns in the valley were developed at least partially on terrace deposits. This is Front Royal here. This is a bend in the river. Of course, the, the river itself was a major reason these towns developed, but, but I suspect that the availability of stable, elevated, relatively flat land surfaces played a role in, in site selection as well. Uh, I've noticed <laughs> that most of the campgrounds in the Shenandoah Valley are on what I call fan deposits. They're not on residual slopes. And I just kind of casually the other day counted up nine, uh, all nine of these uh, near us. This is uh, Waynesboro, Stanton, Harrisonburg here. Uh, all nine of these are uh, on fan deposits, uh, which is pretty interesting. The reason is, is that it's generally in a wooded area, gentle slope. You know, easy to get around. This is just one example. This is Camp Shenandoah where my kids went when they were in scouting. And almost all the campsites out here are built on the fans just because they make, make nice campsites. Um, town parks, ball fields tend to be in floodplain areas. This is Purcell Park in Harrisonburg, just as an example. Um, I guess I should just mention, well, why? Why? <laughs> well, it's flat, you know. 
if it's a soccer field or something, you don't have to do a lot of grading. Plus, you know, if you have a flood and soccer field gets flooded, you know, it's bad for the game, but it's not going to cost somebody a tremendous amount of money. Okay, um, we also have challenges uh, based on the natural conditions in the valley. Uh, this is actually not a challenge. This is just the opposite in this picture. This is an old barn that literally built its foundation on bedrock, right? I mean, they, they took advantage of this outcropping of the Edinburgh Formation here, and they just used that as part of the foundation of the building. Now, for modern building, that doesn't work so good. <laughs> uh, shallow bedrock tends to be a bigger problem. Um, usually, you have to require some blasting if you're building a foundation or you're bearing utility lines, et cetera. So that, that becomes problematic and expensive. Uh, it can be challenging if you have uh, trying to site a septic system and you have shallow bedrock um, or even putting in a sewer system. Um, in areas that have shallow bedrock, uh, there's just less availability for groundwater storage in the local area. And so depending on what kind of well you have, that could be a limiting factor for development. Um, and if you're a gardener and, you know, your yard's full of rocks, it makes it a little hard to get a, get a nice garden in there. Uh, in areas of soluble bedrock, that can, and when I say soluble, I mean limestone that can dissolve over time, that can create challenges. Um, groundwater in areas underlain by limestone tends to be a little more vulnerable to contamination. Uh, you always have the potential for sinkhole development, especially when you're changing land use in an area. Um, and then some of the uh, soils that develop on the limestone formations in this part of the valley are prone to shrink swell, uh, and that can cause problems with building foundations, et cetera. Uh, uh, when we talk about these areas that are overlain by the loose deposit, that can create issues. Uh, some of those areas are unstable. They might have resulted from landslides in the past, and, and there are places where landslides could occur in the future. Um, they can be challenging to excavate uh, and keep a hole open if you're trying to put in a sewer line or something like that. And then they're definitely challenging for on-site uh, septic systems. Um, and then <laughs> if you live on a real rocky spot, you might get your corn, as they said in the song, from a jar. Uh, this is just an example. This is Shenandoah County, Virginia's uh, comprehensive plan. And they're just showing areas where there are limitations on development. Uh, this, all these areas are listed as severe limitations on development, and these are moderate limitations. So uh, you don't see too many easy places to develop there, uh, at least from the county's perspective. Uh, this is a similar map for Page County, but this is showing uh, suitability for septic fields. And you can see the red is bad. <laughs> so, so that's a challenging place, right, if you're a sanitary uh, engineer uh, or a soil scientist to try and find a good site for a septic system. Um, natural conditions also provide us with resources, things that we can use. The indigenous people certainly found useful things here, and we have over the past few centuries uh, done a lot of mining of, of natural resources in this part of Virginia. Uh, this is a map showing uh, areas where uh, materials have been mined in the past, and it, it's not just random. You know, you just can't uh, go out anywhere and, and decide you're going to put a quarry in or a sand and gravel pit. You've got to have the materials, right? And that's determined by the geology. Um, for example, you can see all of these red dots here. These are iron mines associated with a particular horizon in the Blue Ridge rocks. There's another similar horizon over here. All of these pinkish colored dots, these are limestone quarries. Okay. The green are lime uh, mines that were used for agricultural purposes. Gas up here in northern Rockingham County. Um, and then the yellow, it's hard to see on here, but all these dots are yellow. And they're all associated with those loose deposits of sediment. Uh, just an example, this is a quarry that was used for stone to build I-81 up near 10th Legion, Virginia. Um, and this is a big, this is one of these fan deposits uh, this is uh, just north of the Big Levels area, uh, south of Stewart's Draft, and all of this loose material. This deposit is a few hundred feet thick. It's really impressive in its size. And so if you have rounded rocks in your yard, they're probably coming from uh, this site, or there used to be a quarry near Grottoes doing the same thing. If you have square rocks, <laughs> they're probably either coming from core, well, one of two cores in Stanton here, most likely. Um, uh, let's just talk for a few minutes about groundwater. Um, uh, groundwater availability is really dependent on the geology in the area, uh, specifically how many cracks and voids are in the area and how connected they are. That allows water to both enter the, the ground and also to be removed from the ground uh, via a well. Um, we, we find that wells installed in limestones and similar rocks typically have more water in them, 
but they are more vulnerable to contamination. Uh, in the Blue Ridge, in the eastern part of the area, we find these rocks typically have lower yields for a variety of reasons, um, tend to have lower pH, um, but they're less variable in their quality. Um, you, you don't see as much variation in that area. Um, this is a, a map for a project I did just recently. Um, this is looking at areas with these loose deposits, either fan deposits or terrace deposits. And we just discovered, just through a statistical analysis, this is the average well in an area that doesn't have a deposit. Um, it yields about 10 gallons per minute, actually the median well. This is the median well in an area with a fan deposit, has twice the yield, uh, typically the, the median well. And in a terrace deposit, uh, it doubles again. So that really, uh, to me, has some significance if you're somebody trying to locate water in this part of Virginia. Um, and then uh, that western toe aquifer that I mentioned at the beginning of the talk, uh, that's along the eastern edge of the valley on the west side of the Blue Ridge, and it's associated with these large fan deposits. Well, over time, the fans um, have uh, chemically weathered the limestone below them, and then that limestone is dissolved, creating more room for more sediment. And over time, we've created these really thick packages of sand and gravel, and it makes a really important and great aquifer in this part of Virginia. And this is just a map showing murk and cores, and both of those facilities, as well as several f facilities in Stewart's Draft, are there specifically because of that aquifer. Um, and then the last little thing I wanted to point out, this is a new project I've just started playing around with with some vineyards here in Virginia. Uh, how, how does the geology in the Shenandoah Valley affect uh, the vineyards and the wine production in this area? This is just a map showing vineyards in this area. Okay. Um, I, uh, I just looked at this last week. Just statistically, about 70% of these vineyards are in carbonate bedrock. Uh, and that, that's really not that unusual, probably. That's not that far off of the percentage of, of area that's not national forest or national park <laughs> that, is, uh, that is carbonate. Um, but, but the interesting thing is that the majority of them are just two formations, the Beekman Town, which is a dolomite, and the Conococheague, which is primarily dolomite. So I thought that was really interesting. Um, uh, most of the remaining ones, including the Barren Ridge Vineyard, uh, not too far from here, are in shale areas. And the majority are just in one formation, that's the Martinsburg Formation. And then there are two vineyards in uh, the Blue Ridge that are underlain by that Catoctin Basalt and one by Granite. And if you expand out beyond this area, there are actually a number of vineyards in the Blue Ridge that are in both of those units as well. Okay, <laughs> so um, some conclusions here. Uh, I would say that deposition of sediment and magmatism have provided the raw ingredients of our lithosphere here in the Shenandoah Valley. That's kind of the way I think about it. Um, those are the raw ingredients that, that feed into our landscape and our, our uh, you know, area that we, we interact with. Um, but then deformation changed the bedrock, and it also introduced structures such as faults and folds and cleavage planes and fractures, and that created the topography and the landscape in our area. Uh, more recent weathering and erosion shaped the landscape, created new deposits of sediment, opened those fractures up, created solution cavities, um, and it allows water to move through those materials and to be a resource for us. It also produces really variable soils in this part of Virginia. Um, so this last little bit, the variability of the original bedrock, the locations of new deposits, and spatial differences in how much uh, deformation has occurred, they produce this really diverse and interesting landscape. Uh, that provides both challenges and opportunities for the residents here. Um, some acknowledgments, uh, especially to the landowners here. And then I'm going to open it up for questions. Before I do that, I just want to point out, I, I always like this picture of this old barn um, because it shows the uh, ability of the person who built this barn to recognize that this material here, this is a diabase boulder, one of these igneous rocks, um, they found that in their pasture, and I found it too, but it was a half a mile from this barn, and uh, they recognized it was a stronger rock, so they used it for the corner of that, that building. I thought that was pretty clever of them. So anyway, questions, I'm happy to try to answer them. We have time for some questions, and if you would please wait for the microphone so the people online could hear. 
Why is the water more likely, more susceptible to contamination in the limestone areas? So uh, in the limestone areas, we do have more uh, thicker soil, more development of sinkholes. Um, and so the, the, the source of the water that's coming out of your well is, is uh, the, what we call the regolith or the loose weathered material above the bedrock. And so um, there's less filtering if you have sinkholes that are providing conduits more directly to the bedrock. All right, we have another question. I think we have one right over here. If you have a barn with a dirt floor or you're building a house, where do you have to worry about radon? So that's a good question. Um, in the Shandow Valley, I, I, my understanding is that the shale units uh, are most prone to radon production. Some of the limestones have some potential for that too. Um, Really, the concern with radon is more when you have a tightly built structure, like a barn, typically, that, that wouldn't be an issue because the radon is going to vent naturally. It's not going to accumulate. But if you built a home with a, a, a basement, and a really tightly constructed, and, and the air is going to stay there for a while, that's where radon can accumulate. All right, I think we have one up front and then one in the back. Sir, hang on one second for the microphone. There you go, very nice. I have a voice. Yeah. <laughs> I've enjoyed your presentation. <laughs> oh, thank you. Uh, what I'm uh, curious about is I hike all over the Brew Ridge. I find huge boulders. When I say huge, they might be 40 feet across and uh, 35 feet high. Mm -hmm. And they seem to be just set there. There's nothing else around them. Is it correct assumption that they were deposited by uh, glaciers? So uh, it depends where they are on the slope. Uh, further down the slope, that's a possibility. And in some very steep slope areas, I've definitely seen boulders that size that are part of transported deposits of, of material. Uh, but some of the what we call the basement rocks in the Blue Ridge, um, just as part of the natural way that they weather, they have these uh, kind of broad joint sets. And they'll actually just sort of weather in place, and you'll end up with these large sort of boulders. They, they've moved a little bit, but they're relatively in place. Yeah. No, I don't think we have any direct evidence of glaciers in Virginia, certainly not in the last glacial period. We I have, just wonder yeah. how a, a hundred ton boulder come from a cons family constructed people mm -hmm. would just be sort of set on the side of a hill. Yeah, well, there are some, some large boulders that have moved by gravity, that, that's for sure. They're but massive, Yeah. But, but there are some, as I say, that just sort of weather in place, and the soil has... has a, you know, wrote it away from around it. That that in rock and so forth uh, was washed away from around them. Well, the the soil that developed on them, yeah, might have been eroded away. We do see that up in the Blue Ridge in the higher elevation areas. Some large blocks that are just sort of sitting there, relatively in place. Yeah. Yes. Uh, more of a comment than a question, but uh, two, two things on the dating. When any time I have a visitor to Waynesboro, I point at the Blue Ridge and I tell them that's the second oldest still in existent mountain range in the world, that at one, 1 billion to 1.2 billion, the oldest being somewhere in Southern Africa. Uh -huh. And then the, uh, the other interesting date that you mentioned was the uh, um, Native American deposits here to 12,000 which predates the breakup of the glaciers in Canada, most of us are old enough to have been taught that the, you know, the, the Native Americans came, walked here from Asia through Canada, but incre increasingly that, that 12,000 date, and it's showing up all over the Americas, um, indicates that the, at least the first wave of Native Americans came by boat probably, uh, since the, the glaciers would have yeah. basically been impossible to go over, they were so massive. If I had a question, so you mentioned how magnetism affects the area, but I always think of magnetism as being like a very broad thing, um, uh, you know, the North Pole, the South Pole, the magnetic uh, not, I'm sorry, not magnetism, but magmatism, so that's oh, the process okay. of molten okay. rock. I'm sorry, right? I, I missed no, no, the word No then. problem. Okay. Yeah, but the, uh, your question about the Blue Ridge brings up an important point. So the rocks in the Blue Ridge are really old, but the latest research suggests that the mountains themselves are actually not that old. We think there's been uplift in this area in the last 10 or 15 million years. So if you were here 20 million years ago, you might have been able to walk across that area. 
uh, and it wouldn't have been a mountain range at all. That mind blow. We were all taught in school, right, the oldest mountain range that's been weathered for so long, but, but the latest uh, research suggests that might not be the case. I think we have one more question here in the back, but I just want to point out that I think uh, Matt and maybe some of our volunteers will also stick around to answer some questions one-on-one. -on -one, so. Thank you, Matt, for your presentation. Uh, you haven't mentioned precious metals or gemstones for the romantics among us. Are there any in the valley? To so look this for? is a great example of how geologic conditions affect your hobbies. <laughs> if you like to collect fossils, this is a great place to do it. If you like to collect gemstones, not so much. We, we really just because of the geology. Now uh, you know in the Blue Ridge and, and on the east side of the Blue Ridge, we have rocks like unikite that are semi-precious stones that wash out. But but in the in the the west of the Blue Ridge, the gemstone collecting is not a very uh, uh, likely be a very successful endeavor for you. Yeah. All right, I know I said one more question, but we had an enthusiastic hand over here. We're going to do one more. In your research and your contemporaries' research, have you ever seen an evidence not of just finding meteors, but finding an impact of a meteor in the valley? Not in the valley. Uh, we, we have folks bring in rocks that uh, look like meteorites all the time, but uh, but we almost thought we had one uh, within the last year, but in 20 years I've been there, we've never actually had one come in. Uh, and I'm not aware of any evidence in this part of Virginia of, of meteorite impact. Uh, but there is there was a meteorite. I, somebody was just telling me the other day in the Smithsonian they have one that was found near Stanton back in the 1800s that's on display at the Smithsonian. So so meteor meteorites have have landed in this area, but but in terms of an impact crater. I'm not aware of one. Yeah. Matt, we want to thank you so much for your time, and we want to thank the South, Water, or South River Watershed Coalition for all their support and the Center for Cold Water's Restoration uh, for making all of this possible. So let's please thank um, Matt Heller one more time, and we hope to see you next year at our <laughs> spring version of our lecture series.